There are moments in life where victory looks impossible. Good Friday is one of those moments, but, but those moments are kind of sprinkled all throughout our lives. Moments where you just look and say, there's just no way that victory is coming. Uh, I had ex- an experience years ago. I have not been to very many professional baseball games in my life. You can probably count on one hand. But on August 29th, 1986, I was at a Major League Baseball game watching the Detroit Tigers just beat the Angels into the ground. <laughs> and, and so by the, the ninth inning, the score was 12-5. to five, And me and my friends just kind of started talking, saying, you know, you ready? You ready? Should get out of here? You know, just there's a point where you just kind of go, this game's over. Victory's not happening. Victory looks impossible. So we packed up our stuff, and we walked out of the stadium. And what happened next was unbelievable. And I'll tell you about it on Easter Sunday morning. (laughs) Barry was a strapping, athletic, godly, young Christian man. He came to the church where Sherry and I led in Michigan and had two younger brothers. We kind of watched that family because they had three boys, a little bit older than our three boys. And we kind of, you you watch families and you try to learn from them. And and then we got the news that Barry had been standing in the back of one of his friend's pickup trucks. All the guys had pickup trucks where we lived there. And and he had been standing there and his friend didn't know he was standing up and his friend hit the gas in the parking lot. And Barry flipped out of the truck and landed on the back of his head. And day after day after day after day, we prayed. And day after day and after day after day, Jim and Sue prayed for their son. And Chad and Joey prayed for their big brother. As the doctors put him in in an induced coma because of the swelling on the brain. And day after day, we prayed. Uh, People gathered, prayed over him in his bed. And day after day, he got worse and worse. Until finally, the doctors came to Jim and Sue, and they just simply said, he's gone. There's no brain activity. It's over. And Barry, when he got his license, had signed saying that he would give up his vital organs to give life to others if something were to happen to him. And this young, healthy guy that the doctors actually said, you know, if you'll sign here, we can start the process and call the teams to come in for transplants. And they said, they said, we can't right now. We need to go home. We need to talk to Chad. We need to talk to Joey. We need to tell them that their brother's gone. We'll come back in the morning. And what happened the next morning in a situation where victory looked impossible. What happened that next morning was unbelievable. And I will tell you about that on Easter Sunday morning when we gather together. Jesus hung on a cross, exposed to the world. The Lord of glory, the Lamb of God, crucified. On that cross, he said, It's finished. On that cross, people looked and mocked him. Even the thieves mocked him initially. The crowds mocked him. The situation looked absolutely impossible in terms of the victory that people were anticipating to come through Jesus. It was story over. And finally, the Bible says that Jesus said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he breathed his last. And Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, died. He was dead. And and there came a point where the guards were coming to make sure that all three of these prisoners were dead. They were going to take them off the cross, but they wanted to make sure they died first. And they they actually broke the legs of people on crosses if they wanted them to die because most people on the cross died from from suffocation, from asphyxiation. They, They couldn't breathe anymore. They couldn't push themselves up and breathe. And they came to Jesus and they said, you don't have to break his legs. It actually fulfilled a prophecy that not one bone would be broken. They said, he's dead already. But to make sure, a soldier took his sword or a spear and drove it through his flesh and through the bag around the heart and into the heart and water came pouring out and blood came pouring out and he was dead. Victory looked impossible. They took his body, they buried him in a tomb. And to every outward appearance, the story was over. But something very interesting happened a couple of days later. I'm not going to tell you what happened yet. But if you come here on, for Easter services... I'll tell you the rest of that story. Because sometimes when victory looks impossible, God does the impossible. And God shows up. To understand Easter, and we're going to gather together just just about a day and a half from now. We're going to gather together 
to celebrate Easter. But to understand Easter, we have to take a step back to Good Friday. To understand Easter, we have to take a good look at the cross and Jesus hanging on that cross, giving his life for us. The Lord of glory laying his life down for broken, sinful people. But you have to also take a step back even earlier than the cross. To understand what happened at Easter, you have to take a step back to the incarnation when God chose to come among us. And so I want to think together about what really happened, what we're really celebrating and thinking about. So Jesus, we have to know that Jesus really came as one of us, the incarnation, that Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, fully divine, came into human history as one of us. Listen to these words from Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 6. Speaking of Jesus, we read these words. Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, clung to for himself. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. God came among us. The Christmas story, the incarnation. God Almighty coming into the womb of a virgin girl. And then being born into this world and walking among us, a life with no sin. So I want to ask you the first question of our time together. Do we recognize what he gave up because of love for us? Do I recognize what Jesus Christ gave up out of love for me? Do you recognize what he gave up just to, just to come among us out of love for you? I mean, think about where he was. Jesus was in perfect Glory, heaven. We can't even comprehend the beauty and the glory of it all. And he left that behind to come among us, to feel cold for the first time, to feel pain for the first time, to, to, to be rejected, to feel the scourge of the cat of nine tails on his back, when they falsely accused him at a mock trial. You go, why would Jesus Christ, we believe in one God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. One God, one in being, three in persons. But with the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, to say that he came among us as one of us, why would he leave the glory of heaven? And here's the answer, and yet you have to hear this. For you. For you. For me, he came to give himself. He came to go to the cross to pay for our sins and our shame and our brokenness and to put us back together again. Jesus came. So he left where he was. Th think about this. He, when he left the glory of heaven, what he heard changed. In heaven, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Holy, holy, holy. Angelic choirs praise and glory to Jesus. And he left that to walk on this earth and hear cursing and lies against him. To hear people scream, crucify Jesus. From holy, holy, holy. He hears Peter deny him, deny him, deny him, his closest friend. Why? Why would Jesus allow himself to go through that? You know the answer. Do you? Do you know? Out of love for you and love for me. He gave that up so he could one day bring us home to be with him if we would receive this gift of grace. He left perfect community. Jesus had been eternally one with the Father and the Spirit. This perfect, unbreakable, unmatchable connectedness and community, one God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Our minds can't even fully comprehend it, but God bound together, Father, Son, and Spirit, 
And he left that perfect community to come walk among us, to give his life for us. And then on the cross, in a way that it is hard for our minds even to comprehend, Jesus Christ, who had been eternally one with the Father, Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's like he said, Daddy, where are you? For the first time in all of eternity, Jesus felt a rift, a separation from the Father. Why? Why? Out of love for us. Out of love for you. This is why we come to remember him. To remember again who he was and what what he did. In the incarnation, Jesus left all of that behind to come among us. He really came and walked among us. And Jesus really suffered in our place and he bore our shame. He took the cross. It wasn't a mock activity. He felt what we would have felt. He experienced what we would have experienced physically and spiritually when the judgment of our sins was placed on him. And so in 1 Peter chapter 2, we read these words. And just let these words sink into your soul this Good Friday. In 1 Peter 2, beginning in verse 22, speaking of Jesus, he committed no sin. No deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He entrusted himself to the Father. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. For by his wounds, you have been healed. By his wounds, we have been healed. Do you realize that he knew your name? He knew your situation, and he took it seriously. Do you realize that Jesus, when he came to this world, when he went to the cross, he knew you by name? Not in some general vague sense. He knew you. He knew every sin you've committed and every sin you will commit. Every word you spoke that you should have spoken, every thought that's gone through your mind that you wish hadn't, every sin that you, you've forgotten that you ever did and every sin you wish you could forget but you can't drive it out of your heart or mind. He knew it all. And he came for you. And he came for me. I don't think any one of us on our best day would do that. But Jesus did out of love for us. He took it seriously. Our sin, he nailed to the cross. Our shame, he took on himself. For our brokenness, he said, I'll offer you healing. In our loneliness, he said, I will live in you by my spirit and you'll never be alone again. In our fear, He says, I overcome. I'm the Lord. Jesus really came. He really suffered. And Jesus really died. He gave up his spirit. Now, I can't fully, I've been a pastor a long time. I've taken a lot of theology courses. I can't fully explain to you what it means that the one who came among us, fully divine and yet fully human, died. But somehow this happened. That on the cross, Jesus died. We read these words in Mark chapter 15, beginning in verse 37. Jesus has been hanging hanging on the cross, and he's been battling for us, and he's been bearing our sin and our shame and taking our punishment. And in verse 37 of Mark 15, we read these words. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. This picture of separation from God ripped apart as if to say, come now to the Father. Jesus is made a way. And when the centurion who stood there at the foot of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the Son of God. Here's the question. Are we stunned by the reality that the giver of life died like a criminal? See, in the Gospel of John, we read that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God, and then then through that Word, through Jesus Christ, all things were created. 
Jesus Christ was and is the living word of God, the eternal word of God. And he spoke and all things came into existence. And yet he allowed himself to be brutalized by the people he made and loved and came to save. He offered himself for us and to us. He came. He suffered. He died. And Jesus was really buried. They took his body and they put it in the ground. John 19, beginning in verse 40. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance with the Jewish burial customs. This is what you did with dead bodies. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. And a stone was rolled to cover the opening, and a guard was posted. And the story was over. That's what the Jewish leaders hoped. The story would be over. That's what the Roman political powers that be, that's what they hoped would be the case, that the story was over. That it was done. Now, I have a suspicion that you know how the story ends. And when we gather on Sunday morning, that's a time of celebration and praise and joy. But I want to ask you to do something that's kind of difficult for people in our world today. I want to invite you to linger in this moment for about a day and a half to keep yourself in this place of reflecting on what Jesus did. We want, we want to jump to the resurrection. We want to get past the difficult moment. But you know, the first followers of Jesus didn't get to race past that. They waited three days. They didn't know it was on the other side of it. To them, victory seemed impossible. And so I want to invite you for the next day and a half until Sunday morning just to kind of quietly be in this place and linger here to remember that the light of the world went out. When Jesus died, Jesus, the light of the world, the light of the world went out and darkness fell. Darkness fell on the earth. Darkness fell on hearts. That the hope of heaven was buried on earth. That the glorious hope of heaven was placed in a tomb and buried. Hope was six feet under. You know, Peter, who had said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God watched Jesus the Savior die and be placed in a tomb. And all of his followers kind of ran for the hills. They thought the story was over. The love we long for was dead and in the ground. We all long for love. The followers of Jesus met love in human flesh. And now he was gone. What did that mean? What were their hearts feeling? Jesus had loved the outcast, the poor, the broken, the strong, the confident, the wealthy, the poor. He loved everybody. And now he was gone. The long-awaited Messiah was not victorious after all. That's how it seemed. You see, even though Jesus had on a number of occasions said, listen, I'm not going to be a political savior. I'm bringing much more than that. They didn't fully get it. Many of the first century followers, they wanted somebody to to help them stand up and rise up against Rome who had them kind of under their thumb and under their heel and they they wanted kind of a political savior. And it was really clear that wasn't going to happen. And even those who were hoping for a spiritual savior at this point said, he's dead. And he was dead. And the potential for victory seemed from any perspective at that point Utterly impossible. At that moment, their dreams were pierced. Their hopes were beaten. The light was extinguished. And the one that they loved and had left everything to follow was dead. But that's not the end of the story. We'll get to that in a day and a half. Here's my invitation. Until Sunday morning, Will you let yourself remember what he did? I invite you to stay and linger at the cross. 
and picture your Savior crucified for your sins. I invite you to picture the, the, the garden tomb, but not with the, 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 the stone rolled away, with the stone still there. And try to feel what those first century followers felt for three days of waiting and wondering and praying. I encourage you to wear this little ribbon. And if you didn't get one as you came in, you can get one as you get out, as you go out. And, and just put it, you know, put it somewhere you're going to see it or put it on your clothing for the day, all the day tomorrow. And just remember the, the reality of this moment where it, it seemed that victory was impossible. And if somebody, if somebody sees you wearing that and asks you a question, say, I actually got that at a Good Friday service I went to. And if you're at home and you didn't get one of these, then put a, put a black ribbon on if you can find something. Just, and let, let someone ask you about it. And tell some of your story of who this Jesus is to you and what he means to you. And I also want to invite you uh, when you came in, you received a card or there was a card tucked underneath the carpet squares where you are and there's a pen there. I want to invite you in just a moment as I pray, the worship team's going to come up and they're going to, they're going to lead us in, in a closing song, part of a song. They're going to save the rest of the song for Easter, but they're going to lead part of that song. And, and I want to invite you just on that card to write something very simple from your heart. Maybe a simple prayer of confession. Maybe a prayer of thanks. Thank you, Jesus, for going to the cross. Maybe, maybe all you can write is, thank you, Jesus, for everything. Thank you for dying. Thank you for living. Thank you for coming. A, a, a prayer of thanks, a prayer of confession of a sin you want to lay at his feet and say, say, this Good Friday, I remember the price you paid for my sins, and I lay this sin at the foot of the cross. And then as you leave in just a moment, each place you leave, back this way and out over here, and over here there's a cross in each location, and at the foot of the cross is just a basket that you can put that, that card in, a prayer, a confession, a, a word of thanks to the Lord. And so just write down a few words, and as we close, as you leave, take that to the foot of the cross and just say a, a short prayer. I want to invite you to pray with me. Lord Jesus, you are the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And the Lamb was slain. You are the light of the world. But that Good Friday... That light, to every human perspective, seemed extinguished and gone. You are the hope that every heart longs for. But on that Good Friday, hope seemed gone. Lord, we know the rest of the story. But we pray right now that for this next day and a half, we will let our hearts reflect on what you did, why you came, in the midst of all of that, that we would be overwhelmed by the greatness of your love for us. That you came for us, you lived for us, you suffered for us, you died for us. Let us express our hearts back to you in this quiet moment.